Hey, Doug. Hey. <clears throat> so I think I used last week's uh, login. I don't think there's a, you sent one for this week. I have not yet. And I, uh, true confessions, I was just I logged into the Zoom call first to see if there were humans here. And now I'm going to send a reminder right now that says we're starting now, but I didn't send a reminder last night. Fantastic. <laughs> but I, I love was remembering... the background you've got there, the color and the pictures. Thank you. It's actually real. It's like our, my wall. Uh huh. Uh, and that picture, that picture uh, is a watercolor my dad got long ago. And the head is a, uh, this has been in my family since I was a kid. Uh huh. Because I grew up in That's Peru. That's beautiful. <coughs> yes. It is. And then and then that thing is a reproduction of um, of an assembly of uh, what do you call it when you fold paper? Um, origami. Origami, thank you. Origami cranes. Basically, <clears throat> um, our artist friend. Uh, did uh, uh, this is actually the, the the real one is pretty large I think it's probably like six foot by six foot a uh, collection mm -hmm. of origami cranes and uh, we have the a reproduction from her what well, struck me about the head that you showed is that growing up as a child with that you probably absorb a lot of the whole culture that produced it so it's a powerful thing I, I'd never thought of it quite that way um yeah and and I mean Half my kids were local, half my, my friends were locals and half my kids were expats. Uh, only a small piece of which were American expats kind of. So it was like, you know, Filipino friends and whatever. So I had a really interesting childhood that way. And I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish I'd seen much more of the local culture. I wish I'd learned Quechua from, you know, some of the people we, we knew and all that kind of stuff. So I had a, I had a a weird, a weird glimpse of a different world because we had a very privileged lifestyle. Yep. Uh, go send an email to people. I am going to uh, create an email right now, and I think we're in the right place. <laughs> um, so composing it now. If my machine will catch up with me. Good morning. Hi, Klaus. Hey, Klaus. How are you? I'm. I'm okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Many things going on. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff flying. It's hard to keep up. It is. I was just trying to catch up with all the messages around the food project. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. Uh, but we I think we know, we now know enough for what we need to do next to get organized now. So it's sort of the picture is sort of starting to to emerge. <clears throat> How are you doing with your book, Doug? Well, uh, uh, I'm sending out chapter one to right. people who might connect me with an agent or a publisher. Uh, it's been a great challenge to keep writing it. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity because it gives me something to wake up to every day. That's good. You know, I, I think to say that any proposed future is really an exercise in imagination, not in reality. I because things are so incredibly chaotic, we just really have no idea what's going to happen. I'm struck at the moment by the amount of writing that's happening. Uh, which makes it impossible to keep up because some of it's actually pretty good. Yes. Uh, and um, at the same time, I think that many corporations have hired somebody to create language, which makes them look compliant while not changing anything. And that's really mucking up the whole uh, dialogue space. That was really the disturbing thing on this uh, 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 letter, the, the letter of concerned scientists that just uh, made out. Um, I mean, it's basically a pitch for analog meats, right? I mean, plant-based protein extracts, which is a horrible thing because they are they, their feedstock comes from monocrops, right? So Brazil is, is cutting down more of the Amazon forest to make room for this bonanza of uh, 
um, um, meat substitutes, and it's just an insanity. Yeah. So to to see, and OSU is a leading university in the field of agriculture. You now they have, they have an extension, and they're consulting with uh, farmers. So, I mean, it just makes everything more difficult to to have to have this uh, lack of coordination. Now. So I was gonna. Re- to some of this morning's messages on the thread, but just didn't have time because time is seemingly vanishing. Um, with isn't it frustrating to see some good ideas and so many different perspectives vanish on a mailing list, right? And like, like I, I've been on mailing lists now for oh I don't know two and a half decades, maybe more. I don't remember when the first you know mailing list I, I got on was. I do remember roughly when I first got email because I didn't have email in high school or college. Uh, I had email, I guess, by grad school. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, um, but and, and I'm on a bunch of private mailing lists, which means that those emails just go off into the bit bucket to die. And there's some brilliant people on these private conversations who are writing some great things, and they're not they, those those posts don't see the light of day ever again. Right. And that's I find that deeply frustrating. So one of the reasons one of the reasons I believe in curating a longer term context of some sort. And for me, it's the brain because that one stuck for me. But for other people, it could be other things um, is that that allows you to sort out in some more structure what you believe, why you believe it, uh, what groups of people believe, what they might you know, how, how, what actions to take and maybe even what questions to be asking at the frontier of what we know. Right. And so and so uh, so one of the principles, Klaus, that I think your concern would tap into is, hey, before acting on some large scale solution, look upstream and figure out what are the consequences of the action. And in this case, it's like, hey, if we're going to do analog meats, we better make them in vats of bacteria or algae instead of from crops, because otherwise we're draining more crops. Right. And, and there are people working on fake meats from from algae. Right. That that's not a and that would not be a, maybe a terrible solution, but, but every solution has all of these sort of knock-on effects and systems effects, and we don't have a system to play with um, to sort of go simulating and go thinking about how to go about doing these things and compare notes. We don't, we don't have anything like that. Yeah, the image I have in my mind uh, when I was in Tanzania looking at the Great Migration, and you saw that those herds moving up and down trying to, to get across the water, right? And they couldn't make up their mind and the herd is swirling and you know, chaotically moving back and forth until all of a sudden someone, I mean, one of the leaders goes into the water and then or, the rest or, follows. Or, or pushes another wildebeest in front of it. Like, <laughs> That's you, right. you, you, the, you first. And the zebras are always hanging back to see what happens first, right? It's I like, mean, is it, is it uh, this alligator or that alligator? Which one do we want to get eaten by? Yeah, and so, but that's where we are, right? We're swirling, and yeah. the risk is, you know, that we are that we are that we are launching into the wrong direction, and and commit irreversible resources to a bad solution. This is something I've been wondering about a lot lately. We, you know, we're, we're sort of caught between the the deniers and the ditherers of like either there's nothing going on or we don't know what to do, and da, da, da. and the folks saying it's urgent. We got to do this right now. And this right now might be the wrong thing. Uh, geoengineering just is one example that pops to my mind randomly. Um, but that's a very difficult place to be in. You know, we have to move at speed. We have to move thoughtfully. And um, there seems to be a real tension between them, at least in me. And we kind of need to do things everywhere at once. You know, we, have yeah. to, we have to tackle the system in many directions at once. But, but if we did this right, those efforts wouldn't be counterproductive, sort of they, they wouldn't neutralize each other, they would pull in generally the same direction, right? And to do that, we probably need some, some kinds of agreement, some ways of figuring out like um, how things fit, where they work. Well, we have a lot less coherence than a mob of wildebeest. Yes, and, and we have right now the shared memory of a mob of wildebeest. Hmm. Uh, what are wildebeest called in a, like a group of zebras is called a <laughs> dazzle. Uh, a group of wildebeest has to have a name. Yeah, I'm just laughing at Eric's comment. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's going in meta, but I was wondering meta about what. <laughs> mm. 
because I thought maybe I can say something, but then if it's not about that. It's actually called an implausibility of wildebeest. Is it? Yes. You it's didn't just make it up. No, uh, <laughs> it's an implausibility of wildebeest. <laughs> Uh, we can look that up, but but uh, I looked it up in my brain, and I need to fact check it on like uh, in the real world. Uh, so Eric, we started with uh, concerns about climate change and what actions to take, <clears throat> and then I was I was saying that I, I was declaring my grief at having watched so many good ideas go by on mailing lists, in particular private mailing lists, that they just they just end up in the bit bucket instead of being in the world where we can weave them together and make better, bigger ideas, and and you know edit and contribute. Um, and then we have, you know, people writing scientific papers, which are protected behind scientific academic research servers and whatnot. It's like, seriously, like these things need to be front and center where we can work on them together and make them better. Uh, but Jerry, are there just too many? It's not um, like there's one bad proposal for the future is that there are many. Yes, and if we could figure out if we could figure out how to have conversations where we compare notes um, and collapse the overlaps, meaning, <coughs> hey, you know, this theory and that theory are seem pretty different, but 30, you know, 30% of both theories overlap magnificently in this body of work. L like let's let's sort of pin that down somehow and let's figure out what language we like or maybe different languages around the same thing, but this body of work might be rebuilding local community. Right. So and that we might like be, Jerry we who like is, words. Who is we? The question is whether writing is going to be the effective medium yeah. in the near future. Um, and it might be that this needs to be a multimedia object or a, a hypermedia or a transmedia object. Too. Well, it's pretty clearly it has to be, but I wonder, Jerry, you're talking about how do we, and I wonder who is we. If we as OGM, it's one level of the problem. If we as the climate activist community, it's different. If we as the society, it's different. Email is clearly insufficient for any of these. And maybe we pilot stuff here. Okay. Right? And yeah. we do that in a way that's, you know, that's, that's coherent and has momentum and is productive. Yeah, it, it. It. it kind of has been my research until now. <laughs> and I actually have been really working on that. One of the challenging issues there is you can build a prototype, but it won't work because it's so complex that you can't. Eric, you're but breaking in up. In principle, off. I think I kind of like. Uh, sorry, I'm going to closer. Closer yeah. to the Wi-Fi. Back, back to the source. Sorry. Mm. Ah, too bad. I'll I know. Sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. Um, so, what I've been working on or thinking about a lot is like a kind of taxonomy slash um, how to debate, how to bring it together, how to make it visual, how to order it, how to make it fit on a mobile screen. I've been thinking about all those issues and I can't say that like I can't show like a drawing of what it would look like, but I kind of understand how to put it together. So if, if I would have money now, I could just go and say to uh, developers or if I had developers, <laughs> I would just tell them you can do this and this and this and this and this. And it would probably work out in the end. It will be still a puzzle work, but all the research is there and just for instance if and it's kind of a mix and match of all the platforms that i came across like the brain is one element because it is able to relate all the information but then you also have something like convo who does this kind of uh okay you've got you've got like a a document in the document you can underline things and comment on things and then these comments you can relate with other documents and talk about it and bring it together there's all kinds of procedures to make that kind of discussion work online so for me it's just of bringing together all those things and build a new kind of software that does it and there seems to be a lot of frustration of not being able to make it work as a, as a collective, everybody's got their own ideas. And I've, I hear also Jerry say quite often, like, how do we do this together? And I just also had a conversation about, yeah, how do, how do we take our personal brands out of it and start working together on it? And it seems to be a very difficult challenge to do this. 
and not so comfortable to understand it, but it, it's all there at the same time. So it's kind of, it's not a chicken and the egg problem, but kind of like, uh, almost like we, ha we need to have difficult conversations as well about this and how to move forward. We have to kind of tell each other, no, this is not gonna work, but in a way that we don't have to see it as an offense, but as a, as a way to move forward to really work with the pressure and to really work with how to move forward. And, and that's, it's kind of also um, something that's after the last call and like feelings that I had and seeing other groups, how they work together, but also by seeing so many different initiatives, uh, burn out and just quit and give up and think it's not possible. Yeah, I, yeah. Go ahead. That's, that's what I wanted to share, I guess. Um. So yesterday I learned about something called the science of team science, which is a thing I had never, didn't know was a discipline. And it's actually, it's, it's a discipline, an academic discipline of studying uh, sort of how, how scientific collaboration actually happens. Um, I'd never heard about it before yesterday. I was like, oh, that's weird. Um, it's, I think it's a rubric under science and technology studies, STS, which I had heard about. And of course, uh, I started adding it to my brain and all that kind of stuff. But there, there are a bunch of people who've been working on different aspects of this problem for a while uh, who, and we're not really connected. So um, we're not kind of, so kind of, uh, Gil, I think back to what you said, like, could we just sort of prototype it here in OGM and so forth? Uh, the thing that's materializing in my head to do with OGM, and I'd love to fly it here. I didn't, didn't expect to talk about it right now. I was gonna do a normal check-in round, but, we're kind of in a, in a perfect place to talk about this. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, I'm think, I'm, I'm, I'd like to propose that OGM host a show that on the surface looks like a show. And we already post our videos to YouTube. We're already kind of doing a show. It's just not labeled a show. It doesn't look and smell like a show. It wouldn't take that much to produce one where we go and it's kind of, it's like a pilgrimage to people who have deep bodies of work or groups that have bodies of work on how to fix some of the world's problems. Um, but under the surface, we're doing OGM-y kinds of things to all the interviews and to these bodies of work. And we're weaving and connecting and building out uh, with as much clarity as we can what's happening and trying to do ourselves and model for others and then offer to anybody else who wants to come in and do it, how to, how to sort of do that process. And I don't know that we can do it particularly well, but I think that we have purview over and participation from a whole bunch of people who, who, who've been working on pieces of the answer. Like, like a lot of folks who care about this have shown up in the last 18 months or 16 months, or I've forgotten what month we actually started our conversations here, but plenty of folks have shown up with pieces of this puzzle that we could start to assemble. And, and sort of originally I was thinking of calling this something like weaving the world and that was like too highfalutin. So I, I found a metaphor I really like here, uh, which is quilting. And so uh, the big quilt, is kind of the umbrella I've got for thinking about this. And it's like a patchwork quilt is made from various pieces, any one of which should be beautiful, but the patchwork is uh, done often in community with a bunch of people weaving together. And the idea is that the whole quilt should have an aesthetic and quilts, uh, quilts are feminine technology. They are easy to understand. They are metaphorically rich. They are warm and comforting. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things around quilts that I really kind of like. Uh, and then collectively they can make a big impact like the AIDS Memorial Quilt, the Names Project, where a whole bunch of people made pieces, made quilts of their beloved uh, deceased family members uh, and presented them on the mall in Washington one year. And it was like, oh my God, this is, this is in fact a large tragedy and look at the scale of it. And uh, they didn't, they, they laid them all sort of next to each other and you could see what was going on in that way. So, so I'm wondering, could we stand up a show within which the food project is a series of episodes and has its own stream and is busy sort of contributing to, to how this works. And we, we could be, and, and there's, there's a zillion podcasts out there. There's a million blogs and shows, but I don't think any of them is busy trying to weave and leave behind an improved memory of the work with, uh, with sort of a variety of perspectives into it um, as we go. So let me pause there. Go ahead, Gil. Um, um, two things. Uh, I, I, I didn't respond to the quilt metaphor at first, but what, one of the things I like about it is that it's inherently multimedia. 
it's it's tactile right <clears throat> it's visual it's oral because the people sitting around quilting are a community talking about whatever they talk about while they're quilting so that part of it is wonderful the the challenge i hear jerry is 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 what gets left behind how do we leave behind how do we shape the leaving behind because this becomes just another one of the million shows exactly and a billion podcasts without that um, I mean, I've, I've been on email for, I think, about 42 years, uh, and I'm tired of it, mm -hmm. you know, and, I, and I'm lost in it. I used, to be, I used to be a maestro. I'm just lost. I'm behind on everything. Uh, it feels like a very ineffective way to build a conversation and coordinate with people. I'm just, <laughs> just, just trying to keep up with this last, if this is real thread uh, over the last few days, has been, has been tough, and there's, there's gems in here. And for me... Bye -bye. For, so for me, the gems are sort of dropping into the bit bucket, and mm -hmm. and uh, and I've had this feeling for a really long time. Like, damn it, that was a great post. And every now and then, I mm -hmm. will copy the post out and save it. I think many of us do. Like when we see something great on email, we copy it and try to put it somewhere ourselves. I often put it in my brain, but because it was on a private list, I, I make it a hidden thought. So so I mm -hmm. know that it's there, but nobody else is going to discover it, which is terrible. Mm -hmm. Um, so like Indra's net is also an interesting metaphor here. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's an old way of looking at things. And there's kind of there's kind of like jewels within a net and the jewels are at the nodes of, uh, of the connections of the net. Uh, and these pearls could be kind of those jewels <coughs> in, in a net of wisdom that we're that we're collecting up. Uh, Pete is building massive wiki in a way that that builds it out of markdown files living on GitHub. And for those of you who who um, are, haven't been following that thread, Markdown is a really, really simplified form of, of adding some information to text. So, hi, uh, so the web is built out of HTML mostly, hypertext markup language, Markdown is a simpler version of that that lets you say, this is a title, this is a bullet, things like that. Um, building from Markdown on a shared platform like GitHub, which is where open source code goes, but a lot of other things besides open source code are going, means that um, the standard means of findability and replicability are kind of just under, under the hood, which is really interesting. <clears throat> then if you take those primitive building blocks and you start building interesting things on top of that, you can, maybe we can create some really interesting uh, ways of doing this. And, and Mondays, there's a little call called Free Jerry's Brain, which is part of OGM. And we've been trying to figure out, like, what's the next platform? How do I, you know, I, I'm not trying to say that everybody should be using the brain. I'm saying the brain has a couple of attributes that really, really work for me. And that's why I got hooked on it. Other people use other kinds of tools. How might we make these tools talk to each other better and talk to a separate <coughs> data layer better so that this data layer is persistent over time? And so that the data, so that when I improve a node that's about, uh, what's his name, Alan Savory's, uh, we should graze more and more cattle on the land because it's good for the land. When I add something there it, with my tools, it should be enriched for someone else reaching in with their tools. The way that a, a Wikipedia page is improved by all of us communally so that the next person coming in sees, oh good, you know, the new Pope has been named and there's a Wikipedia page um, for unfortunately him. Um, go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, I mean, my, my thought has sort of evolved to and, and landed on this idea of innovations brokerage uh, because the, the challenge really is to connect with practitioners who are in the field who are working there who have no time to, uh, for you know, to spend hours in conversations and learnings and sharing information i mean they're in the field working and so how how do we get best practice information you know to to that group and that's what we're working on with this uh, farm to fork community food systems and you can see how challenging that is right i mean the the, the, the just just to to remove the distrust and to have people you know really uh, accept and appreciate your intentions and then finally come to the point where they forgive you for stepping into something that was not quite right because they start trusting you right that the whole thing is based on trust and so i i would i would just uh and, 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 I, and I'm sure there are other uh, areas, right? whether, whether that's uh, the, the way a community does energy, for example. Right? There's so much opportunity you know, to share insights and knowledge and, and, and things that are already best practices out there. Um, I see that in this, this uh, uh, citizen climate lobby and, and business climate leaders, because there are so many ideas floating, you know, where where they are, where we are now really in the mode of replicating knowledge. Uh, 
And part of what I'm envisioning, Klaus, is that your innovation brokers, old school, I tried to, in the chat, I tried to say old school and it came out old stool, which is terrible sounding. Um, but old school thing would be maybe we would have created a field manual for the innovation brokers and we would have handed them a book or a file or whatever and they would have gone into the field with that or an almanac or God knows what. Uh, middle school would be there's a database of things you can do and so forth. I think the, the new thing, the new environment is what is this resource rich environment that the innovation brokers can dip into that includes woven connected knowledge but includes hey, you're interested in doing this thing over here, this project you saw that happened halfway around the world, you'd like to do it yourself. Here's, here's an implementation toolkit and here's a couple experts who know how to, how to do it. They'd, they would love to help you if you want them to show up. And here's some funders uh, who are looking for somebody who's leaning into fixing this kind of problem. And that blend turns into some action on the ground somewhere, right? So I, so I think the medium needs to be friendly to the, all those different kinds of layers or elements as we go. And I don't think it's one uniform medium. I think it's a, it's a, it's a convergence of a whole series of uh, kind of blended, uh, I'm just gonna call them webs of, of what we know, right? Um, so I, so, I, so I, for me, this, the big quilt, it, one of its sub projects is to create, uh, and maybe it's one of the places we can start is to create a body of work that innovation brokers um, live off and feed as they learn things, right? That they're busy contributing to. And part of part of this is like literacy and how to do that and, and so forth. Any other thoughts on, on quiltiness and uh, creating a show of some sort? Uh, John, and then Eric. Um, you're muted, John. You're trying to find the unmute button. No, no, you're having a different kind of problem. Ah, uh, shoot. Um, until, why don't you troubleshoot uh, your unmuting? Do you want, I don't think I can unmute you because we're not in my, oh, there we go, good. Uh, but now we can't hear you. So, so you're successfully unmuted, but we actually are not hearing your, your, your voice. Maybe, nope. Maybe you can mime. <laughs> uh, could you, could we play charades? That'd be awesome. Like four words, sounds like. Um, John, keep troubleshooting, yeah, fix stuff. And when we hear your voice, I'll go back to you. Sorry, Eric, the uh, floor is yours. Uh, yeah, so one issue is uh, like in the weaving, there's also something about platform weaving and everybody's got their own code structure, um, <laughs> uh, code language. Um, there's, for instance, there's like a matrix, which is a platform that brings together different chat tools. But then if you go deeper into knowledge and knowledge sharing, it really becomes a problem. So my understanding until now is yeah, I, I want to build my own platform because this will be way too challenging to bring everything together. But at the same time, I like it that there's people attending it, but we're, we're not near there. And it's really important to understand where to put your energy. For instance, Trove and um, uh, Massive Wiki, two completely different projects in terms of code they could work together uh and it you could make it work in a way with apis and it's getting simpler and better to do apis and to make them share knowledge together so there's hope but i'm not understanding if it's realistic and if it's the best place to put your time and energy so on fridays there's a flotilla call which is vincent from trove pete uh michael's been showing up uh and a couple other people and they're busy the calls are intentionally uh, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong here, but they're intentionally kind of a white space between the projects. And the intention is to talk through what each of the sovereigns uh, or independents is trying to get done and what, where they're aiming so that they might actually collaborate and share the load and connect well and work more seamlessly together. And they're still working on that. And as you said, like they're building on different Good. platforms in different ways. There's a, they're, they're going about it in, in different ways, but they're, yeah. but they're in the a fruitful conversation to figure out what that middle space is. I'd love to join the calls. Yeah. So that sounds great. Uh, let's go uh, Ingrid and then Doug and then John. And John, are you back? I'm back. Oh, let's go John, Ingrid, Doug. Okay, this may be, this is implied by what you've been saying. And so it may be obvious to everybody, but just in case it's not, that there's two levels of integration in the quilt metaphor that, that I really like. One is that there would be a physical quilt, but of course there would be an electronic quilt. 
and you know uh, the links between them and the updates to the electronic would eventually get into the physical. That's very cool. I like I like that. There's a similar thing go possibility, which is implied by the the sort of taxonomy of elements that you went through, Jerry. In other words, that just as the electronic and then using the metaphor of quilt and linking to the old reaches out to people who have an emotional attachment to the old and buffers their collision with the new. Similarly, uh, the whole <laughs> project of creating, of, of restructuring the knowledge, and you, you, you talked about it in terms of, you know, okay, definition, discovery, implementation kit, resource, fundraising, but there's also the idea that you create that as a ramp. So in other words, uh, people can come in uh, without, you know, they can come in on the idea that, oh, agriculture has been under-considered. The, the effect is bigger than, we thought. okay, yeah, so there's something about meat. Yeah, yeah. Um, totally, absolutely. You, you know, in other words, this, this, this pathway of, to sophistication and pathway of clarification is intentionally uh, ramped in, in how it's done. And that's specifically a technique both to not throw off the people who have trigger words, say, oh, if I see that trigger word, meet, you know, I'm gone. And also to, you know, basically help people grow in terms of their sophistication. So maybe all that was implied. I, I got it, it from what you were saying, but I just want to make sure that that's both, both kinds of ramping are an explicit part of the design. <clears throat> Um, absolutely, and I'm not sure how to how to conquer that, but because one of the problems with showing up at something that's kind of done, like a systems diagram, like when I look at complicated systems diagrams, I am lost. And the way I have access to them is when Gene Bellinger or Christina Bowen does the build, and they say, hey, it starts here with wolves eat rabbits, and then it goes here and here and here and here and here and here, and suddenly like you've got the, the Rube Goldberg thing that actually describes a working system that's that, that credibly describes a working system, and then you're in. But we need on ramps, and we need we need to find simple ways for ordinary people to go. I'm curious about this, and then step in. And some of that's going to be about finding a person who's also curious and exploring with them. Some of this is about forming learning cohorts, and there's a piece of this web, this Indra's net which is about and just learning and education. And it's about how, how do we learn things? What do we know? Uh, all of that kind of things. Uh, so let's go, uh, sorry, Ingrid, Doug, then Gil. Hey, um, I may be a little bit off base on this, but I keep going back to the fact that people need um, a demonstration. They need, I mean, going back old school to a video or a way to engage them or to pique their interest. I think, um, and especially if you want to make it a diverse group that you're speaking to, and not just be scientists and academics and things, but uh, yeah, I would just think you have to have some, a really engaging real life demonstration of whatever you're talking about, even if it's the most abstract thing, like what you were talking about, Jerry, to ramp it up, just to bring it to reality in, in people's minds. And, and whether that's like a video or it's a a, a lecture that um, you know or teases them and then brings them into the lets them know the different pieces of it. I just think making it a simple, accessible way to bring people in. But yeah. um, absolutely, everything you said, and a, a simple way to hack our way toward that might be to set up a couple of the early show episodes to have meaningful conversations around stuff that matters to people broadly not like white guys who are, who are technicians. Um, and then in those conversations to do both heart and mind where, uh, because a, a huge piece of this is about trust and about just relationships and about coming to, back together into community and figuring some of that stuff out. So we, if, if we just, if this is just an intellectual conversation about solutions to problems, we've already kind of missed the boat. But if we can build some trust and then start pointing to how systems work and what solutions are, and then model them in the call. So screen share, do this, do that, and have links <clears> to the artifacts at the end, and then begin building a series of episodes where after the episode, we actually do some, some post-processing. You know, we, we fix it in post, as they say, but, but we actually then um, <clears> begin working through the artifacts and how they are made accessible, how anybody else can contribute to them, the way people contribute to Wikipedia or bodies of open source code today, 
by using similar methods, <clears throat> then, then we can boil that down to a, a several different three minute videos that, that make the point and have some of those different elements together and are easy to, easy to process filter and are, are interesting to attract people to, to join the, the party. Does that, does that make yeah, some and, sense? Yeah, and with, with action plans, you have to give people a, a lead. You, you can't just leave it open, I don't think. I think you have to direct people a little bit to help them to get where they need to go, but yeah. Absolutely, so what you're describing is steps that should be in the project plan for the big quilt, which I appreciate a lot. <clears throat> um, sorry, we had uh, Doug, then Gil. Okay, uh, I have the uncanny feeling, and I wonder if other people are feeling something like this, that what we're talking about is really too slow to have any impact on the rapid unfolding of real events. Uh, in my fantasy, the only action that counts right now is uh, attacking the headquarters of the oil companies. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen. Uh, but short of that, is there anything that's actually going to be effective? And, and I feel that, that we are just, uh, Jerry, you just used the phrase, miss the boat. Uh, I don't know if there is a boat, but we're missing it. Um, thanks, Doug. And my own feeling is I see lots of people on fire with like great urgency to do different things. And I see that we are incapable as a society to actually come together and do things. So I'm trying to figure out a way to build enough trust that we can actually do things in some degree of unison without perfect coordination and certainly without command and control from the top. But, but how might we come back together and, and sort of regulate and unify and coordinate our actions well? And to do that, we need to have shared artifacts uh, to get in there. And I'm sorry, we haven't built them very well in all of civilization up until now, uh, but, but it's it kind happened. of time to start. So we have, but they're what, what if we tried having that conversation amongst ourselves? Uh, which conversation do you mean? The... Uh, where are we, what should we do? We've sort of been doing that, and we've been doing that in this frustrating. I mean, this. But, this but no, do, do it. Let's do that with the with you know, with with prototyping the tools that we're talking about here. Let's Bingo. kick OGM up a notch to something but, else. I, I want to follow up on what Doug said, but but first a couple of points from along the way. Um, the the. Um, Systems mapping as a process, not as an artifact, Jerry, is critically important. And you know, watching somebody build that map is great. What's even better than that is building that together with a diverse group of people, yes. multi-stakeholder like Scott Spann at Innate Strategies will do, for example. And they've done that with you know, at least dozens, if not hundreds of people from across a region working on a theme and building together and iteratively asking people, what, what's missing here? Is this complete to you? Is this accurate to you? And keep on building the map until everybody looks at it and says, that seems about right. And you've built a constituency and a community for a very different kind of engagement and action. So big, big thumbs up on that one. Um, on the information broker, um, I, I have an immune response there because it, it, like, it sounds like a commercial activity, which of course it needs to be, but it's also an amateur activity you know, from the root of love that we all do. And so it, it's something that needs to happen, but not only be monetized and yet supported. So that's a design challenge to throw in there. Um, back to what Doug said, it's a good question. And attacking the headquarters of the oil companies is a good answer, but you know, what does that mean? I mean, you could sit in at the headquarters of the oil companies, that's great. Um, there's, you know, there's what 70, Seven, you know, a hundred companies that are responsible for seventy percent of emissions on the planet. So maybe it's not; just, it's mostly oil companies, but not only. So let's take that list. What does attacking them mean? Um, one thing it means is shut them down. Um, and the usual way to think about those things is regulations, but another way to think about it is um, is as um, um, stranding those assets, buy them out, and close them. Uh, and this is a proposal we made about the coal industry a dozen years ago. It's actually happening through economic forces. But you know, at that point, the, <clears throat> when I first started looking at this, the market cap of the coal industry was less than the value, than the cost of the subsidies to maintain that industry. And you ask any business person or any Joe or Jill on the street, if you have a company that is costing you more money to keep alive than it's worth, what would you do? And the obvious answer is you shut it down. So attacking the oil companies means killing the subsidies, which there's already momentum on, 
It means some mass of capital buying them out and shutting them down. It means boycotting them, perhaps. It means shaming the people involved in them, perhaps. But it also has to mean a, a very rapid safety net to transition people out of their dependence on oil. So this means you know, people in Boston who will freeze to death if there's no oil. So you can't just turn the switch off. Um, and if we look at the infrastructure bill moving through Congress this week, uh, you know, the climate action piece is, well, trust us, we'll get to that later. Well, maybe you will, I'm not so sure. So my question back to Doug and everybody is, what does attacking those 70 companies look like? Um, and, and last night, I just forgot to say it before, in terms of thinking about platforms and all that stuff that we've been talking about, um, we need to recognize that this is a group of extreme life forms on this call. You know, we are unusual people in the way that we play and talk and dance around information. And so we're, it sounds like we're having a two level conversation here. One is what will serve us and sustain us in the work that we're committed to in the world. And second is what can grow out from this that can be accessible more broadly to more regular kind of folks who are more inclined to you know, watch sitcoms and play with massive wiki. Thanks, Gil. I, I, I agreed. Um, and when we start getting into the solutionizing, like whether or not to assault the headquarters of the oil companies and buy them out and strand the rest and all that, I sit here aching that I wish we had a visual where we were connecting and collecting this. And, yeah. and you know, and I, I've got, I've got that particular topic about shutting down the oil companies. I've got all the oil companies. I've got a bunch of stuff. I don't have that. So I would have to slow down the conversation just around that little spot, go back and do that. And I would hope that there'd be a dozen people doing similar things with different tools with a different perspective from mine. And that would be really juicy and interesting uh, to do. Uh, so let's go Klaus and Michael. Yeah, I, I, I think we are in a strategic uh, paradox and I'm particularly seeing this in the food system because that's you know, what, I, what I know more about. You, on the one hand, you have an existing system, you know, a status quo system that has an enormous inertia to maintain its business models. But those business models can't really continue because they're so destructive. But on the other hand, you can't really change a system like this unless we first of all change the social system. That means physical change has to start with the social systems, community level really, to, to help people, first of all, to, to secure themselves, food, shelter, right, belonging, so it's to secure themselves, then they can go and start uh, repairing the environment and, and restoring the ecosystem and protecting themselves. So my, my, my favorite saying is a desperate man will cut down the last tree to live another day, right? So for as long as people are are getting more desperate and look at what's happening right now. There are millions of people at risk for getting kicked out of their homes. So you have more homeless camps coming around. So what are we doing to absorb that and turn that into a constructive energy? Because right now we have people who are, who are desperate, right? I mean, they, 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 are, they are seeking, my wife works at a local uh, food bank. I mean, she comes back in tears every day. With what you know, she sees uh, a family that got kicked out with two kids living in their car. I mean, it's incredible, right? The things that that we that we don't acknowledge, and so unless we fix that first, we can't get to any of these environmental issues. It just it just doesn't work, and there is no focus on on and no willingness really to fix the social systems and and, and help people to secure themselves. Um, absolutely, Klaus. And I think the reason I, the reason I try to care equally about heart and mind is that so much of this is about mistrust and, and politics. And, and a lot of people are suffering because we're wedged politically and, and a bunch of, it, it, it's in somebody's interest to have refugees moving around and to have strife in the world, et cetera. So we need to figure that out. Uh, Michael, before I pass the floor to you, I just want to comment on your comment in the chat, which is like, I, I'm trying to figure out how to model this. To, when I say prototype, I mean the exercise of the practice of doing this thing uh, out of found parts. Like, like, hey, here's a platform that I've been using for a long time. Let's use that. 
let's approach that platform and see if they'll add this feature. If the feature doesn't exist and we can't figure out how to do that, now what do we do, right? So, so, so I think I think a piece of this is is seeing some way clear to prototype a way of being in the world of sharing data and and being on collective inquiry, and being open to alternate uh, opinions, but then getting past some of the same arguments in in some way. Uh, and I'm hoping that this might transform how politics and government work, how education works, maybe how science works, all those kinds of things if if it's done right. So. I think maybe hold the word prototype loosely. And, and I, I think that conversation is super interesting. Um, so off to you. Yeah, um, just for, for people not looking at chat, I was, I was saying, I was worrying about the idea of creating prototypes and, and OGM inventing new things and standing up this and that. And just that, you know, this is as, as Gil was saying, an incredible group of smart and usual people. But, you know, we get together and, you know, we talk and, and there are things that we say and Jerry, you know, what you were saying about shared memory and the, the lack of it at the beginning of, of, well, a little while ago, very true, you know, uh, but we're not the only people who have who've come to this realization and the number of attempts out there, I just feel like we're not searching for another and how we can be the most effective we can be in, um, you know, we were having a conversation about this yesterday, Jerry and, and Stacy and I, about um, what OGM can do and not be, adding to the number of standards, but like supporting things that already exist. And is it that, you know, we are a nonprofit that's pulling in money that's identifying projects that exist and supporting them or getting them to interact with each other as opposed to like being another thing? Um, yeah, I can can just comment. But our wheel is rounder, um, and uh, <laughs> more spokes. Um, <laughs> you know, it, the, there are just there there are so many many people doing the things that we're doing, and I I know we're smart, but you know we're we're not smarter than everybody else. Um, and uh, how can we not? You know, it, we've been talking for, you know, I've only been part of it for six months. And I know you guys have been at it, some of it, you for a year before that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sort of <laughs> at a loss for what to say. And, and I don't mean to be negative. I, I want to be positive about what we do. And I feel like it, it can't be invention. We haven't invented anything yet. And if we start trying to decide, you know, now what we're going to invent and then execute on it, that is too late. And, and there are people in more action. And, and, you know, Klaus, I think, you know, it is, you're almost an exception here in that you're, you know, doing something that we're supporting and that's cool, but, you know, we're not saying, oh, that's a good idea let's all come up with a new way to do it among us, prototype it, you know, we're supporting you and doing what you do. Um, and, you know, the, the, the funding um, notion is the simplest one I can think of, you know, maybe there are other things that we can do that are ways to support others, but I don't think it's us coming up with the better idea even if it's not prototype, even if it's just an idea and then convincing other people to do it, just about anything we can come up with, I feel like there are already people out there doing it. Let's figure out a way to support them. Um, I think this is a great and deep question we need to stay on. And it's a frustrating question because it's like, how do we go about doing what we're trying to do? I typed the Metacurrency project into the chat because I've been friends with Arthur Brock and Eric Harris-Braun 
<clears throat> and a few other people for a really long time. And I remember getting a briefing on their metacurrency project at least 15 years ago. Um, and Holochain, which that was probably the more familiar term, Holo and Holochain project is a, is a calving off of just one hunk of their metacurrency project when blockchain got hot because they're like, you know what? We have a cleverer way of doing blockchain. And so there's, there's this project. So I have watched for several decades as incredibly smart people had a complete idea about how to fix the universe that still is not a thing in the world. And I'm, I'm, just, I'm just stating this because it's frustrating. And like, these are brilliant, well-intentioned folks who've thought very deeply about how to fix stuff. And their, their, their stuff, their platform isn't yet a thing that's rolling in the world properly. And I don't know that it will be, and, and I hope it will be, and I'd, love to and, I, and I'd love to help. And I'd love to see what insights from their work fit, who, what, other, what other insights, and, and how to be a part of making this thing actually come into being and stand up as maybe part of the platform we need. Now, and then I'll say also, when Klaus is talking about innovation brokers, I think he's innovating. He's, he's suggesting a novel idea called an innovation broker. And it's modeled a little bit on Peace Corps or other sorts of things where there were volunteers who knew something about whatever and showed up to help. Okay. But it's, it's a new thing and it would have new kinds of roles and all of that. Um, and so I, I think that that's interesting innovation and I want to help stand that up and make it, make it move in the world. So I don't, so I, I think there's this very interesting question of between what, what's new, what's existing. And, and I, I don't think OGM has the resources or the desire to go build one platform to rule them all or anything like that. But I think we see something that maybe a few others see, but not a lot. And if we can help model that and prototype it and then let others perfect it and make money on it and whatever else, I think that's a, a big win for us. So let me, let me go back to the queue. Ken, Eric, Stacy. Doug, I saw you raise your hand. Did you want to comment on something Dre was saying before I speak? Oh, sorry, Doug. Well, just very quickly, I think one of the things that's holding us back is people hold, including us, for a win-win solution to where we are. That is something that takes us towards the future that's better than where we are. The reality is I think most of us have concluded there's going to be lots of losses in this system, and we're just reluctant to talk about that. Um, and there's a whole group of people, uh, Jem Bendel and the Deep Adaptation crowd are saying exactly that. And, and like, that's one of the groups we would need to at some point to approach and talk to. So agreed. Uh, Ken, go ahead. So Michael, uh, something you said uh, sparked a thought in my mind and it goes back um, some 20 years to when I was running coaching cafes. Um, I had just been a newly minted certified coach and uh, I was working at the World Cafe and I was bringing together all these coaches from my school, New Ventures West, to talk about what they were learning and out there in the world. And we came up with this distinction between practice field and field of practice. And OGM can be both. It, for me, it is a practice field. I come here to engage in deep conversation with thoughtful people to improve my work in my field of practice. And that's one way of looking at OGM. And there's also the other reverse lens of in what ways is OGM actually a field of practice? Because um, we have these conver this convergence of all these different people from uh, different walks of life, different abilities, different um, interests, you know, and we are in fact creating a, a practice field here as well um, and, and a field of practice. So I never know exactly where I am in OGM, whether, I'm, you know, am I improving myself for my, for my work in the world or is this, is this my work in the world? And I just wanted to throw that out as a provocative lens for looking at this. The other thing, I had breakfast the other day with Bob Horn and we were discussing this paper on hyper objects and, and how, to, um, how to get people um, engaged when there's, you know, the role of the media has traditionally been to explain things, but now the media has been co-opted and very, very complex topics are out there that require some kind of fairly neutral person or entity that can put out the information and recognizing that because the science is not settled around a lot of things, there's going to be arguments. There's going to be things, you know, counterpoints, points and counterpoints. And most people are in a simple binary mindset of it's either true or it's not, right? So how do we, you know, what role can OGM play in shifting that mindset from binary to, I don't know what the, the word is, to, to a range, to a spectrum? Right. Um, I just finished Bob Johansson's book on full spectrum thinking, which I highly recommend. You know, gaming is one way 
uh, maybe OGM wants to start to invite Jane McGonagall in and start talking about gaming um, because there's a lot of ways that we could um, develop games that would develop uh, these kinds of capacities in people to hold multiplicities of, of truths or, or semi-truths in mind and say, well, what's useful based on this? You know, what we're seeing here, what we know, what's really useful from where I am? How can we move forward with this? So just a few thoughts popping up in my head. Thank you, Ken. That's really, really generative. I appreciate it. Um, Eric, then Stacy. Stacy hasn't talked, so let Stacy go first. <laughs> it sort of ties into what um, Ken was just saying. I'm just sitting here thinking that the major shift that needs to happen is this way of thinking. It's the connecting piece that's missing. So if we go back to the beginning of the call, we were talking about um, the, you know, so there are people that don't want to eat meat, but they really want the meat taste. And as Klaus mentioned that, you know, the production of this, you know, protein based, you know, the plant based food is not good. And so it's like, yes, it's good to do it. No, don't eat it. And then it wasn't until I heard Jerry say that there's another way to make this kind of uh, plant based meat that I thought that's what you know, like that's the missing piece. Instead of saying, no, you don't need meat. You don't need the taste. What about if you put the effort into getting the people that are making this plant-based meat to do it differently? So it's sort of like not either or, but, you know, combine both. Thank you, Stacey. And there's a couple things where I think it's like not like slavery, kind of not either or and racism and bigotry and sexism and all those kinds of things. Uh, and at, at the ends, they, those things get fuzzy, but really those are not to, not to either or. I think they're pretty binary, even though we seem to be having those fights daily in the press and in politics and all that. But, but those things to me are like, can we, just, can we just sort of solve for those? But everything else can be complexified. There can be clever solutions found. I, I studied, I had the great luck of studying for a little while under Russell Acuff, one of the inventors of systems thinking when I was at Wharton. And um, he used to he, he used to talk about dissolving problems, and he gave us a couple of stories that like stuck in my head. One of them was uh, his, he was at a consulting firm, and his neighbor had a project for the city of London where the conductors were hauling the bus drivers for the city bus system out to the curb and beating them up, like there 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 was like this was really bad. And it turns out, uh, and I'll, I'll shorten the story. It turns out that the bus drivers were being paid to hit every stop on time. The conductors were being paid to collect every fare on the bus. And at rush hour, the conductors couldn't make their way through the bus fast enough to do it. And Russ's solution to the problem, which he sort of gave to his buddy whose project this was, was at the start of rush hour, have the, have the conductors step off the bus and collect all the fares at the stops. And at the end of rush hour, have them step back on the buses. And I'm like, shit, that's, that's like so smart. Like it cost nothing. It was just like smart. He stepped outside the system and figured something else out. And there's not always a, a simple story like that, but, but Acuff, th these things, these stories that he would tell over and over again were called Acuff's Fables. There's actually a book titled Acuff's Fables. Um, and he would soften up his audiences by telling two days worth of stories like that before engaging them in brainstorming and thinking differently about creating a new mission statement and doing a bunch of other stuff in a process called idealized redesign, which I got to participate in once in Argentina um, a long time ago. Um, but anyway, I love things like that. And we're not in a place or a space where we can even have those kinds of conversations and get to the, to the clever solutions to thorny problems. Um, and to inspect and critically look at the knock-on effects, the unintended consequences, the, like all this stuff, you know, the more we, we mess with systems, the more we have unintended consequences. Um, and, you know, there's like geoengineering. Let's, let's put up a Dyson sphere outside the earth that we can then control like the reflectivity of like, seriously, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the scale with which we think we're imagining playing with some of, the, some of the global systems because the situation is so calamitous and we have to act quickly is deeply frightening to me. And, and by the way, there's some billionaires who might be just about to go build some of those things despite whatever we might wanna say. And that's interesting too. So Eric, I think you're uh, next. And if you, if you are raising your hand again, leave them up. But if you've already spoken, please take your hands down. Okay, so reaction to Michael before he said, do we need to invent something new? And then there was like a, a weird thing going on for me. Like, 
Uh, yes, absolutely. We do need to invent something new. We need to bring it all together, though. It's not like we need to invent a new golden egg that solves everything. It's just one simple solution. No, it's kind of this meta thinking, puzzling it together, but in a way that it works. And that's immensely difficult. There is social, social processes going into it. It's interaction design. It's about thinking how people actually use software. How does it work? Like your brain, how does it make choices online? How does it deal with information visually? How does the database behind work? All that kind of stuff is a, a big, big, big puzzle. And if I hear that there's other people doing all these interoperable things, then yes, I, I would like to talk about them. I don't necessarily trust they will find the answer because it's a, it's a difficult puzzle. So that puzzle, that's the new thing. But it's, and then another level is, how do I talk to those people that I don't agree to? Um, at first, when I, I saw Michael, sorry that it, it's two times you, but it's exactly a point that I want to raise. Like what, when I searched, first saw you enter the space, I thought, oh, once again, someone with his own platform. <laughs> like he's just trying to do his own thing. Uh, do I want to be honest with him? Do I really want to say that he's just yet another guy with yet another idea? But now you're saying the exact opposite, actually. <laughs> like saying, no, we should actually work all together. I think that's also what Jerry has been saying. You give like subtle hints during the calls. I think you were saying this in January and we we're saying long before as well. But it's a difficult process. And um, I, I just want to make it an exercise also in these calls to, to under, understand how do we talk to each other to make our ourselves open up, but also it's uncomfortable <laughs> to say these kind of things to each other. And yeah, that's that's maybe a repetition of things I said before, but I think it's a, an ongoing process, yeah. Um, so Eric, thank you. And I, I would just love us to just go into a moment of quiet, just to ponder where we are and what Eric just said and, and how this fits because you, you put your finger on a really important dynamic in our process here. So let's, I'll, I'll bring us back out of a, a little bit of silence. I, I used to attend Quaker meetings regularly when I lived in Connecticut, and I once attended a separate meeting about how Quakers make decisions, business decisions. And it was held in a bookstore, and the guy teaching at one point asked us a question, and then we were all like, ah. And then he said, why don't we just go into silence for three minutes um, with this question? And I was like, how the hell did I get to be 35 years old and nobody's ever given me time to think before answering a question? And I was always like Arnold Horshack, like me, 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 oh, oh, oh. And it was like a big enlightenment. And I'm like, well, why, does, why is this not happening more? And, and one of the things that's frustrating for me about what we've been doing is that we don't have time to slow it down. As Doug says, the house is on fire and basically about to go off the cliff uh, over the waterfalls. You know, the, it's like the... Larson's Crisis Clinic cartoon, which I adore. Um, like, like the planet is doing that right now. We're busy doing that to ourselves. And ironically, in order to solve it, we actually have to slow things down a bit. And we have to rebuild trust. And we have to do all these other things. Because otherwise, I don't think any of these initiatives actually work. I, 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 there was a Republican press conference this morning about the hearings. And I heard like two people talk and Scalise came up and started talking. And I was like, wow, his lips are flapping, but like I disagree with every syllable he's saying. It's really astonishing. And that's his job is to, to basically stop this juggernaut of, of, hey, we're trying to actually help people. 
uh, and I, th I think part of it was about the infrastructure bill and all that. And I'm like, we're not going to get any place if we're busy, if the house is completely divided in such a perilous way. Um, so, so more of that. Uh, we have done zero check-ins and we've had a delightful conversation for an hour. I would like actually to, to, to uh, unless somebody has a, a thing to go back into this conversation with right now, and, and that would be great. I'd love to just go into check-in mode for the, our remaining half hour um, and take us out that way. Does that work? And Julian, thanks for being on the call. I know you have to switch calls. Uh, if you wanted to check in real quick uh, before bolting. Uh, I was gonna say most of this week I've been cat herding and I'm actually being quite literal. Uh, tried to introduce cat number two to the household and cat number one doesn't want a cat number two. Oh. But the house has been like a DMZ the last few days. <laughs> Sounds like fun. A uh, young new cat? Yeah, they're both 16 weeks old. Oh, okay. Wow. Well, good luck with that. All right. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Julian. Uh, Phil? Yeah, um, I think it's been a great uh, conversation so far and kind of to echo what Eric was saying. I, I like the idea of the big quilt. I think it's a great kind of front end for people to engage with OGM externally to, to people to, to come into the conversation, to get new perspectives in our internal conversation. Um, and then I think the next part of it is defining what the other aspects of OGM are, like what, what projects we want to support, what, what initiatives we want to support, um, and what like the small victories are, because we do talk, we do tend to talk very high level and very aspirational, but trying to figure out like, right, in the next month, what can we do? In the next two weeks, what can we do? Um, to, as Doug said, make immediate change uh, and to, to make substantial concrete progress. Um, I'll just leave it at that. And I'll add that Tuesday mornings at 7 a.m. Pacific, we have a build OGM call, which is meant to be um, more pragmatic, more getting things done, more, I think we're slowly making our way towards objectives and key results, OKRs and things like that, but painfully slowly. Um, but but we, I would very much like to do that. Um, what's exciting about Klaus's project right now is that it gives us an opportunity to actually stand stuff up uh, and begin moving on prototyping. What does an innovation broker look like? And seeing, you know, what, what, what are the component parts of that? How does it work, uh, et cetera. So, so we have that as well. Um, who else would like to check in? I'm gonna ask for uh, volunteers for a moment. Failing volunteers, I'm gonna ask Ken to go first. I'll, I'll go uh, Ken, Ingrid, John. You got me in the middle of going to the kitchen to get my tea. Oh, sorry. Um, no worries. So um, I am having a very interesting time. Um, thanks to Matt Saya, who I think a lot of you know. Um, he invited me to be part of a facilitation team uh, that I've been working on now for about a month. Um, there's a global financial services company uh, whom I cannot name because I'm under NDA. And there... Um, uh, Matt's company teamed up with this financial services company and another company who designed a, an 80 to 90 minute uh, presentation on diversity and inclusion. And I would say that I've done 10 calls now. Um, there, uh, let's see, probably, this is all at the director level. We haven't gone down to the organization yet. And so the majority of people are white. There've been some people of color um, and a small number of women, usually two, maybe three women most of, on the call uh, versus eight to 10 men. Um, and it's about impact versus intent. And it's really interesting to see how people um, hang on to their intent. So one of the examples that they've done is uh, they did a bunch of deep interviews inside the company, came up with a number of scenarios that have been uh, anonymized and they're enacted by voice actors. So one of the things is whenever I uh, give a presentation, inevitably somebody comes up to me and says, wow, you are so articulate in a surprised voice as if a black woman couldn't be articulate. And so people are saying, but, but it's meant as a compliment. I'm, my intention is a compliment. And trying to get people to understand the difference between impact and intent is much harder than I thought it would be. Um, I have folks, especially people over 50, that really hang on to, I don't understand why telling someone that they're articulate is a problem. And 
you know, the distinction between you're inside your bubble that says, I'm giving you a compliment and you're not stepping into their shoes that says, I've been raised in a culture I've been put down my entire life. And whenever I speak up, I get told, wow, you're so articulate. It doesn't feel like a compliment. And I'm just really struck by, by how challenging it is to get people to recognize this one simple thing. And that's kind of filtering through the rest of my consciousness around the other work that we're doing in the world of shifting people out of their, their bubble of, but this is what I'm intending, you know? Um, that's just been really interesting. And I will say that probably 80% of the folks are getting it. So there's, there's some who are just really, you know, stuck, but um, and there's a bunch of other stuff in there, but that's been the most interesting, the impact versus intent. And for me, it's one of the, um, one of the key things. If we can start to, to recognize, um, wow, I intended something to go one way and it went a very different way. I, I ask people, I tell people the best thing you can do if you get feedback is to listen non-defensively. Don't try to justify yourself. Get really curious and say, thank you. I didn't realize that. What else can I do? And in this instance, it's, you know, don't say you're articulate, say, wow, that presentation you gave, you wove things together in a way I'd never thought about before. And I, and I have this question, you know, I really learned something. That way they know you're paying attention and they get the compliment without having it feel like it's denigrating in some way. So um, that's a big part of my life at the moment. I'm back doing some more work for the census, which is extremely boring. Um, I'm not, I had one woman who refused to talk to me. So I called her building manager. She refused to talk to me and I went to the property manager um, and they said, I can't give information out unless my boss is here. My boss isn't here. Who's your boss? They gave me the name. The person doesn't even work at the company anymore. So I am totally getting the fucking run around. And, wow. um, you know, I, 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 I'm having a hard time with, with the way that people are handling that, but otherwise life is good. Um, you know, I, I have, an, I'm using gray water to water my garden because we have this horrible drought here and um, just trying to get through my days and, and find ways to smile. Thank you, Ken. Um, two things about the conversations you were describing. One is one of the things I loved about early online text worlds was that they masked identity. And it's one of the cool things about games where you get to go in and pick an avatar. And I wish it were made compulsory for every white man to have to be in one of these worlds uh, as somebody who's not a white man, um, because they would very quickly figure out what a, what a shit show that is. Um, and I think, so, so there's this idea of walking a mile in someone else's shoes inadvertently, accidentally, uh, in some other way. And I think that that's a really powerful thing. I think, I think firsthand experience is, is awesome. And if you can simulate that in some way, I think that's great. And then the, the second thing I wanted to add was nonviolent communication, a terribly named wonderful process. Um, one of the things that's lovely about it is that it, requ it requests, its process is that per person A says something, person B is, is asked to mirror what they said, to respond by saying, I think uh, this is what I heard you say, and correct me if I've got the, the format wrong, but this is what I heard you say. And then the act of actually saying without agreeing to what the other person said, the act of having to think through and paraphrase puts you in their shoes for a moment and begins to soften the distance or the separation between you, at least that's the theory. And I think it kind of works because this is a really, it's a very useful process. But those are two ways of getting people to start to uh, experience other people's lives in some way that might, might actually be helpful. So, and, and Ken, I think you're fully aware of, of, of all those things, but yeah. just, does, does that play in? Another book in the, in the chat called um, Taking the War Out of Our Words, Powerful Non-Defensive Communication, which is different than nonviolent communication. It's Sharon yep. Ellison, who's over in Berkeley, and I had the opportunity to go to her house a few times, and, and she comes out of uh, child advocacy. She's, a, she's an advocate in court for children and um, really has done a great job of, of distilling how to, how to speak non-defensively, which is different than non-violently and um, really worth checking out. Uh, there's also something called clear language, uh, which is interesting. And all of these things, uh, like all of these things are resources that ought to exist in a shared memory that we could be able to sort of dip into as if we were conversation brokers or facilitators or whatever. Like, like, like as, as we share these sorts of things. And what I do is I, after these, show, after these conversations, I go back and I curate what I can in my brain, but I seldom have the time to actually do it, give it justice. So if we were doing this collectively, we'd be uh, better off. Um, Ingrid, John, Stacy, Doug. 
So, hey, I am, I'm about to uh, end my job, my uh, grind uh, this week. And so I'm super excited to have a little time to think and not be bogged down with that for a little while. Um, and then uh, actually next week I will, I mean, uh, yeah, next week I'm going to attempt to walk the Camino. We'll see where I go with that, but to have a little bit of time to recover from this year, which has been a really really tough year, to be honest, to be an expat um, alone in a foreign country during a pandemic. So it's been a hell of a year in a lot of ways. Um, the other thing I want to ask all of you is, I know I spoke a tiny bit about this in my very infrequent speaking with the group about something that I am building that's um, involving agriculture, agriculture, art and innovation. And I would love to see if um, anyone is interested in taking a look at what I have put together and giving me some feedback since you are all in the sort of um, investment world or um, agriculture world. I, I love what Klaus is doing. That's definitely a part of my project. So um, it's, uh, it's something that I'm finding um, is being spoken out about a lot is building communities a very specific community. So when you were all talking about building these platforms and, um, and APIs and, and linking all these things um, in a sort of high level space, um, me as a sort of a doer and a project manager, immediately I want to put that into action. I want, I feel like even small actions that you can get into this paralysis of analysis, right? You've got so many smart people in this group. There's so much going on in the world right now that literally if you don't put some, even a small action into a physical action, we are doing this and it becomes, it will manifest other things. So for me, I feel like uh, the, the deck that I've been working on in this community idea is actually um, a prototype for building a physical space where you could test ideas and bring the right people together in a disruptive way and a lot of diversity because I, we all know, right? Diversity is the thing that sparks innovation. You can not have the same like-minded people. I don't care how smart they are. You have to put in a lot of different pieces for the puzzle to, to produce something. So anyway, just a lot of things I think about. I always get inspired with these meetings, but um, I want to do something now. I feel like I might have a little bit of space now to think about it. And um, I hope that no one will mind if I, <laughs> if I send you something and you take a look and, and uh, hey, I've been through Hollywood. I can take any kind of abuse that comes out or whatever. But if you're really, um, and I live in the Netherlands, so you can be fully honest. And I would like to see sort of, um, you know, and, and it's along the similar lines of, of everything that you guys have talked about in bits and pieces. So anyway, throwing that all out there, um, a little bit of spaghetti on the wall and um, yeah, <laughs> preparing you for maybe, uh, yeah, an approach. So that's Thank all. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. Are you on the Mattermost chat? I forget. Uh, gosh, I'm not sure because I have not kept up. I see the emails that come through, but yes. So, um, so depending on your preferences, you, uh, there's a couple of people who've offered to read uh, if you want to send individually, but you could also post a link to a document on like the food uh, channel and on Mattermost. We can make sure you get, you know, get there. And that gives you a broader audience for, of, of people to reflect on, on the ideas. So we could figure okay. out what the, what the right channel is. But, but if you just want to send it to individuals, that's fine too, whatever your preferences are. I might wait a little bit <laughs> until I get it to the whole, but yes, uh, yeah, eventually for sure. Okay, so for Thank now, you've you. got a couple of people to send it to you right away. Okay, great. But don't wait. We have a team working on those things and go join the team. I know, I'm, I'm super excited actually. Yeah, because we're, we're of like minds on, on quite a few things. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I also wanted to point out there's a, a thing called the Writer's Workshop Process, which is uh, a, way to, um, a way to have a group of people uh, work on a text and make it better without insulting the author. Uh, it, it's, it's designed in a way to sort of protect the author's kind of ego. And uh, there's a series of questions. The author sits outside the circle. Everybody reads everybody else's uh, contributed pieces to the, to the writer's workshop. And then one at a time, uh, the author of the piece sits outside the circle. And then everybody talks about what the work seems to be, what would make the work better, 
uh, and then the author is only allowed to ask questions at the end. And it's it's never about what moron wrote this piece of work is like not permitted in this format. It's it's like how do we make this work more of what it seems to want to be. And also, I, for me personally, I want to know if you are getting the same thing out of what I've written. If you are taking away what my idea is, that's super important. Yeah. Love that. Um, cool. So we had, uh, blah, 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 I got to scroll back up. Uh, John Stacy Doug. Hey. Uh, well, I, I'm being asked to do things. Uh, I'm doing still doing some editing around identity. And I don't, I don't particularly agree with where that's going, but I'm trying to you know, cooperate with it anyway. Uh, in terms of my own work, there's, there's an intersection between several things that we just mentioned. Uh, I've done the writer's workshop thing in the writer's workshop several times. It's, it's really good. And then there's the budget process, which you may remember my talking about, the participatory budgeting as a way to deflect uh, people who very sharply disagree but just going to say, so how much money do you want to put down and where do you want to put it and all that kind of stuff. We need some more of those. We need something that's not as doesn't require the degree of commitment of the writer's workshop and doesn't isn't as because um, you just can't do a budget for everything, you know, but but you do have a situation where. Like I can get a bubble browser and I can bring up two websites that are take the same data and do weirdly different things about it. And I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think of what is something like the budget process that would engage people who disagree in a way that's interesting enough that they will stay with it, but is playful enough and, and role protected enough that they won't um, go, after, go after each other uh, with pitchfork. So I'm, I'm noodling in that space. And anybody has any, any ideas, please send them along. Thank you. Oh, thanks, John. Um, Eric, did you want to reply to that? Uh, yes, on the whole processy thing, uh, because I, before I said like, what about old school meeting notes? And then I had a second thought. I think it's good if we have something which is one image that we come back to every week and we build on the image, but we can't have more. <laughs> like a, something like a mind map or a, a kind of mirror, but we kind of look at, ah, where were we last week? And then we, we don't need, need to build all the call through on it, but like all these processes that were named now that we could use, they are in there. And then we like, okay, we talked about this last week. What we'll do, what we'll do now is as next steps on, on these exact insights that we had. Other, otherwise we risk rehashing a bit too much and not really building effectively on them. Thanks, Eric. Uh, let's go Stacy Doug Phil and we're getting close to the end of our call time. Yeah, um, I'm really interested to read Ingrid's about Ingrid's project and I just really want to say the most important thing I think is that trust and connection piece and all the other problems that I hear like Ken talking about or whatever, it really boils down to that. And there is no quick way to do it. It happens one connection at a time. I really believe that and that might be disappointing to think about but but th that really makes the difference and it lasts and it actually does go quick you know if you think of the old prel commercial and you'll tell two friends and so on and so on those are all one connection at a time and that's all i have to say i agree with everything you just said except maybe the one connection at a time part because sometimes an action happens in public view that sudden that suddenly escalates trust or suddenly or suddenly somebody does something stupid and you can feel the trust level in a room just, just drop, right? And, and so there's a, there's a collective nature to some of this trust thing, but, but by and large, the building of trust is like, my, my, favorite, my favorite social change technology is taking somebody by the hand to try something new. Well, I, think who, I'm I think I meant really in terms of like people getting offended by things, you know, how offended I get at something that somebody says depends on how much I trust who they are, where they're coming from, and their intentions. Exactly. Totally. Um, Doug, then Phil. Okay, I, I'm thinking back over our meetings and whether we've ever had a serious conversation about scenarios. My memory says no. Uh, I think the most likely scenario is that things are going to fall apart. 
and then there will be emergent phenomena that we cannot predict. So the question is how to be flexible and ready to help out in that circumstance. Um, that's worth like several calls in and of itself, mm -hmm. that, that couple sentences. Do you wanna just riff a little bit on it? Well, uh, it starts with when I feel lost, I like to go to scenarios, but in the sense of oh, where are we? How did we get here? What can happen and what should we do? It's a framework that I trust with myself. Uh, and I think we're surrounded by emergent phenomena right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's too much to sort out, but something will happen, mm -hmm. uh, guaranteed. Uh, let's be prepared to participate in it. Mm -hmm. I really like that approach, Doug. Thank you. Um, Phil? Yeah, um, I like that as well, Doug. One thing that just sparked for me is you saying, I don't remember if we've talked about this. And it's one thing I think we can focus on just week to week is how we enact best practice and how we are an example for people who want to work in knowledge and facilitate knowledge and facilitate sharing, making sure that our meetings and our knowledge and all that is being documented or standardized or organized in some sort of way that we can share as a blueprint um, for other organizations looking to do similar things. Because there's, I know we record our meetings, there's just so much, I guess, lost by either missing a meeting or, or not being having time to review the video. Like there's, how we make, like if Doug was curious about this one topic, how could he look back over our meetings and see where we've discussed that before would be an interesting thing to explore. And um, at one point way early, uh, Max Harper uh, took our transcript of one of our calls and mapped it in Miro because he's a Miro black belt coder. And that was really interesting. And you could easily envision, and a decade ago, I was at a meeting where the meeting was videotaped and, and, and then later, there was a transcript that was timestamped to the video. You could kind of go back and forth and that that whole experiment just disappeared, like not, not available anymore. Why that's not a standard feature everywhere, I don't know. Um, and I just wanna, uh, Gil, I'll, I'll come to you in a sec. Um, I just wanna go back, cause Doug, your, 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 your question is cascading through my head. Um, I think one of the things that we can do, and again, we've, we've threatened to do this, haven't ever really done it well, but we've been doing it really in little, in little bite-sized pieces so far. Uh, is connecting communities in a trusted way so that by the time unexpected things happen, we actually know whom to reach for and we can work together and not have to like look around because there's this old saying, you don't find any atheists in foxholes because everybody's praying to God. It's like, you know, uh, God, please don't let me die. Um, it's too late by the time you're in battle to go start to build these kinds of bridges because there will be people who lack resources and are angry and are <clears throat> and are, whatever it is. And we have to figure out how to bridge these various communities in ways so that when bad shit happens, our assumption is that they have good intent coming back to us and saying, hey, this happened, we need, we need some help. And I think that, that some, I think that one of the most useful things we might be able to do is in the process of this inquiry and of weaving a, a big quilt or something like that, uh, to actually uh, leave behind the trail of new connections of trust that are usable and flexible in, in, in moments of emergency. Um, and I'm forgetting, uh, sorry, Gil, I was gonna go back to you. Um, yeah, thanks, Jerry. Uh, just briefly, um, uh, Michelle Holiday did a uh, Zoom call yesterday. Ken was on, oh, you were there also, weren't you? Yeah. Yes. Uh, and she did a wonderful thing this morning. She sent out a, a Google doc with a transcript of the conversation and a transcript of the chat and invited people to, to pick a color and, and, and highlight and add, highlight the, the things that stood out for them. And that strikes me as an interesting first step, maybe in combination with Mattermost, to uh, let us take another layer of work on what we do here, not just highlight what we like, but highlight potential actions, maybe have a template alongside where we could distill things out and translate them into some other form. So interesting experiment there that we might want to take a look at. I don't know if you've seen it yet this morning. I uh, have not, not made it through my emails yet. But. Yeah. To, it's to in Messenger. It's in Messenger. Yeah. Oh, thanks. good. Okay. Yeah. That's right, Stacey. You were there too. Messenger's not letting me respond for some reason. So I got to figure that out with Michelle. Um, 
Um, Doug's pushing a lot of buttons for me this morning. Thank you for doing that. Um, and you know, in 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 the emergence of, of of shit and fans and so forth, I think the the question is not just what can we do to take care of the world and the things that we care about in the world, but also what can we do to take care of ourselves and each other, because uh, we're going to be caught up in the mess too. Uh, and you know, some of that is more present for some of us than for others of us. But uh, it could get crazy. And how do we how do we support ourselves in that in that physical world, tangible way, not just in these conversations together? Thanks, Gil. Uh, Michael, Eric, you good? Uh, you're muted still. Sorry, I, I was not, uh, did not realize I was. I didn't have the queue uh, filled out. I, I, I've forgotten who's got on the call, so I'm just checking. I'm gonna, do you want to check in? No. No. I'll, I'll, no. Thanks. Okay, cool. Um, Eric and Klaus? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to figure out how to move forward uh, <laughs> in the sense of um, what are the potential partners I could work with? Where could I get money? Um, mm -hmm. How could I get fundraising? Uh, and I love that the word fundraising has been named and maybe that's something if somebody together with me could hold this thread of, okay, fundraising, how do we do this for OGME kind of things? It's all, I've already seen it pass in Kiko Lab and also in, in between in conversations, but it's so important if it's part of how do we take care of ourselves? Like so many people don't do this, even don't come to these talks, I think, because they're doing their day job. And this is even more information for our brain. But if this would be paid for, then that would be much easier, I guess. And so um, I was also thinking before, like, oh, maybe I could get a chariot job somewhere. Uh, and I've been thinking about it several times because I think if, if you are in the right place, you would be amazing. I think you would be an amazing consultant in some places. For Thank instance, you. we're trying. Yeah, uh, Rios Partners is just one tip. <laughs> I don't know if you heard of them. Which one? Rios Rio. partners, I'll put it. They feel, yeah, in the chat, thanks. Oh, yeah. Rios, yes, I know about them. Yeah, they might be a good place for you to search for a job one day. But um, so I, I, I would like to make this a running conversation topic that comes up every week, maybe for a brief moment, if possible, or every few weeks to talk about uh, the money part and the fundraising and how we can get money for the things we really actually want to do besides the day job that maintains us. Yeah, I think that's the main thing that I want to say right now. Thank Many you. more things, but that's- Yeah, exactly, thing. exactly. My, <laughs> brain My brain's buzzing right now. Uh, Klaus, yeah. I think you'll have the last word on this call. Yeah. Yeah, we had, <clears throat> we had uh, a really good week last week in that we have been able to sign up uh, two more case uh, clinics, one from with Trisha from Costa Rica and one with Christiana from Greece who has, uh, who lives in a remote village. It was a heartbreaking for me interview with her uh, to get her prepared for the case clinic. Um, I, I mean, the, 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 her story is on Mattermost, if you would like to listen into that. I think we, we have the, the, uh, the chance, the ability you know, to, to build out a platform where we can work uh, as individual independent contributors, autonomous agents, but contribute to a common cause. And uh, I, I do, and Jordan is now on board to secure funding. I think there are funding sources available if we can build a case, we need to build a case. You know, we need to, to set up a professional website. We need to create some professional materials, articulate, uh, what this plan is all about, but there is there are so many people trying to figure out how to assist and how to help. And I think we 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 have the energy and the um, uh, the uh, spirit in place, you know, to figure this out and and uh, and see how we can get uh, on on a community level 
to uh, to develop uh, a support structure, you know, the way we can. And the, the point of this innovation poker, which really is the way we are visualizing this, is you have a platform. Out of this platform, we're reaching into a given community and, and seek to map the relationships within this community that determine how that food system functions. And then on platform level, we are extracting uh, what I would call a blueprint uh, out of this story that comes from the community and then reach out into, uh, into the broader world to seek support, uh, supporting um, capacities that we can link up with this community and, and see how we can resource those capacities. So for example, there is an NGO working in the uh, Central American fear space specialized to assist subsistence farmers to convert into regenerative organic production and link them with markets. So, you know, I mean, first thoughts, listening to Trisha, can we connect uh, Florence, who is the executive director, she was on one of my panels uh, in a webinar that I was holding with a Citizen Climate Lobby. She's a wonderful, uh, engaged and motivated uh, leader of her group. She has this target of wanting to convert 1 million subsistence farms into regenerative organic, make them self-sustaining, you know, make them uh, create the ability for them to support their families and their community. Can we link that, you know, and can we then step out and, and resource her, Florence, with her organization to staff up for this particular project? So, so there, you know, there, there are all kinds of ideas spinning around, but we just have to, we just have to put it down on paper. You know, we have to uh, be able to to show this to someone so it becomes understandable. You know, in in a in a in a in a moment in a forty five uh, second uh, elevator pitch. You know? So yeah, um, I mean, take a look at what we're doing at Mattermost, and if you feel so inspired, I mean, uh, please please join us. You know. Mm. Thanks, Klaus. And I think the next couple of weeks we'll see a lot of progress on, on this project. So I'm, I'm happy about that. Um, per Eric's request on the chat, uh, why don't we synchronize ourselves for a moment and take a nice, long, slow breath in. And then a nice, long, slow breath out. And to that, I wanna add my gratitude for your presence and your heartfulness and the co-thinking involved in this funny little journey that we're on. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you everybody.